There's like a matrix kind of red pill, blue pill phenomenon I'm seeing from this that's causing, I'll just call it societal collapse. And what I mean to say is when you're inundated by a certain subject matter, school shootings, police brutality, whatever, on social media, and then the algorithm keeps feeding you that content, and then you come to perceive that as the only existence, as the real world, you're basically in this matrix. You are in, you are in the algorithm's world. Now, being fed these stories, you'll immediately become an advocate, saying like, we have to stop this. And you'll start giving your energy and power to politicians who don't actually care to solve any problems, just exploit your fears. And then there are people who are sort of awakened to this, right? So the blue pill, red pill, you're, you're in. And, I, and, I'm, and, I, and I, I hate the political red pill, blue pill thing. But I mean, quite literally, like, there's an algorithm at play on social media crafting a world for people that makes no sense. Because they click on police brutality and the algorithm says, let's give them more of that. It's good for business for the company that they're on the website more. So let's do more algorithmic content feeding. And then there are people who are just like, I'm sick of the algorithms. I'm just going to shuffle it up. I want to I want to read. I'm going to investigate on my own. And then they, they break out of that system and say, hey, wait a minute. Something's not right here. Now, the problem is we're having this conversation about the, the rarity of school shootings, the, the rarity of unarmed black men being killed by police. Both Both circumstances, extremely awful. And shouldn't happen. And we should do what we can to make sure they don't happen. But extremely rare. So for us to put, you know, 70 something million kids through school shooting trainings, because you said, what do you say? 10 will die. I think on average it's 10. It may be a little bit more uh, some years than others. But generally speaking, more kids die in pool drownings or in some kind of drowning. Like they should be, swim lessons would be more useful for children than, than school shooting drills. But see, here's what happens the people who live in the matrix, in this algorithm, you know, or this media narrative or clickbait, rage bait, grifter, whatever start voting for policies based on a fake worldview that was fed to them to make money. And that's why I think it's gotten so substantially worse to the point where it's like, you know, we feel like we're at each other's throats. There's, there was a literally a shootout this past weekend. Uh, one of the, I guess, a proud boy got shot in the, they were shooting at him and he got, he, he took a bullet in the leg. It was, uh, uh, I don't know if he was a proud boy. It was the guy tiny. I thought he was Patriot pair, but people are saying proud boy. And there was a shootout a couple weeks ago in, in Portland as well, where thankfully nobody got hurt. But what happens is you have people who will vote, who will run for office. And, and, and it's, it's not just like you live in a matrix where there is an overseer keep, keeping you in the matrix, like people would believe if they saw the movie. No, no, no. The people who are running the matrix live in it too. The people who are taking the blue pill, who believe that there is like a, 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 a it's, it's, it's a pandemic of police officers going around hunting down black people, they run for office based on that and then try and pass laws based on that. And you try and tell them it's not real and they'll snap at you. They'll call you a Nazi, a fascist, all right. They got to protect that worldview. I don't know how you break yeah, out of that. I mean, look, I, the other day, something I've been writing about is basically pandemic responses across the world. Because one thing I notice is that the U.S. response when it comes to uh, children is very different than most of the world, most of Europe, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, you know, we're we're requiring masks in most school districts in the United States, even for children who are four or five years old, six years old, which actually is much more conservative than what the WHO recommends. It's more conservative than what the European health agencies are talking about or most of the Australian districts. And, you know, to buttress my argument, you know, I just put out a basic graph from the CDC showing that child uh, mortality, child deaths from COVID-19 are very, very small. They're a very small percentage. They've, generally been the same throughout the pandemic. And you know, the instantaneous response you get to that is that you're minimizing the deaths of children, right? Literally posted the facts straight from the <laughs> CDC showing the context of this. And I think that, you know, part of it is that I think once you've adopted the activist mindset, the moralizing mindset, you have one goal in mind. And that goal, of course, is protecting children from COVID-19, which is a totally understandable goal. But at the same time, when you're not getting the whole picture, you're not looking at all the other possible ramifications of keeping kids in this crisis mode for basically forever. And you're not considering the points of view of other people in the world who are not doing that. You know, in, in British schools, they're not doing that. In Australian schools, they're not doing that. They're using largely rapid testing, social distancing, uh, some some uh, vaccinations at the higher level, like 16 and 17 year olds maybe are getting vaccinations, but they're not having toddlers running around in masks for the most part. Um, and UK has had the Delta variant. You know, they've had this experience. They've seen this movie. Um, and yet they're not doing it. I think we're not really giving any weight to their to their concerns because we, we fixated so much on one problem. 
And that I think is really, you know, not only is it corrupting journalism, it's corrupting society because I think we need to be well-rounded people, right? A bird can't fly with just one wing. You gotta have right. two wings, right? You gotta be able to understand things from more than one point of view. And you have to be able to look at more than one problem in society because I think we've created a lot of problems for ourselves by not doing that. I think things like um, certain kinds of overparenting, certain kinds of overscheduling children. You know, I talk to kids these days about like what they do. I do some community work with children and I talk to like some kids about you know, well, what's their summer like? And they're saying, oh, you know, I go to band camp, then I'm at, you know, algebra class, and I'm blah, blah, blah. They have a full schedule. They're busier than I am during their summers, right? That's a huge change in society, you know, generational change versus what it was in the 1990s or early 2000s. And, you know, maybe there's some positive benefits for that. Maybe there's some drawbacks, but we have to be able to look at both sides of it. Otherwise, we're only seeing half the world. And we could be missing a lot of threats to our children if we, if we continue to, to address or threats to anyone else if we continue to address social problems in that way. Per uh, perspective, I, you know, the, the difficulty is the hysteria. There's money to be made for the media. When a, you know, a, a shooting happens, the media says, this is big, run it. Look at, look at, I don't know if you saw the Project Veritas expose where they had the CNN guy being like, you know, we just run the COVID death tracker because it plays well. You know, it's like it was gangbusters for the mm -hmm. ratings. That's what they're thinking about and it drives panic. And panic, you never want to panic. You panic, you cause problems. If you're in a fire, the last thing you want to do is panic. You want to be calm, rational, be like, okay, here's what I got to do. Here's what I got. I got to feel the door. I'm going to get down, get under the smoke, all that stuff. Instead, the media just screams in everyone's faces at the top of their lungs, screaming panic. And then people panic and then they click more and then they get more, you know, they make more money. They make more ads. They get more subscriptions. And it all ends up, you know, uh, going into every facet of society. It's not just the media. It's now in like... Uh, regular businesses. It's in the medical, it's, it's, it's in like movie theaters. It's in, uh, um, burger joints. Yeah. Where, and like, I mean, and, and look like panic is part of human nature for a reason. It's in our evolutionary response. If you see a saber tooth tiger, maybe it might be a good idea to, to run and dart in the other way. Well, uh, but I, for to most, be honest, if I saw a saber tooth tiger, that'd be cool. I mean like, Whoa, that's I true. They were extinct. <laughs> that's true. Um, but that kind of evolutionary response or instinct is only useful in some select circumstances where you're really seeing a direct threat in front of you complex social problems really never really they never really benefit from panicking and if you think about like who we think of as the great leaders throughout history whether they're generals or theologians or activists or uh so on and so forth they generally had a calm thoughtful reasoned response to the social problems they were dealing with i mean we admire the uh sclc and SNCC and, and king's movement um when, if you actually look at some of the old photos, and I think it's actually, it still exists, the Highlander Center in Tennessee, where they were training civil rights activists, they would have people sitting at a, like a lunch counter, a mock lunch counter, someone will be pulling the hair, another person will be blowing smoke in their face, and they would train them just to like brush it off, just say, I don't care, I'm gonna keep, keep on the course of action, right? That's, th those, are the, those are the modes of thinking or the temperament that you have to adopt when you're dealing with really complex, high pressure problems at times. And I think treating everything like it's, you know, the bear just walked into your camp and you better, <laughs> you better dart uh, leads you astray a lot of the time. And, I, and unfortunately, I think that we have so much technology and so much of the commercial products that we use today are basically based on using that kind of response because that's what they want to bring out of you because that's what, that's what will make them money. Yeah, well, I don't know how you, how you break that. Right. If, if, if we it, I guess that's a, a problem of, of, of the free market, right, that this system in place makes money. Mm -hmm. So it is being incentivized. You know, I'll, I'll go back to what I was saying about the algorithms feeding kids this this endless stream of police brutality stuff. Well, companies rose. It's very simple. Company A and company B start up. Company A does legit fact check journalism. Company B does rage bait activist stuff. Which one made the money? So over, um, over the course of uh, six months, the real news website does decently and the grifter outrage site makes tons of money. And then the investors come in and say, oh, that one makes money. Let's do that one. And now it's been a decade of this. It's been, it's, it's been 13, 14, 15 years of this. And now we've built this massive ecosystem of, hey, we make money when we just tell people what they want to hear instead of informing them of the truth. It's not only that they make money doing that. I mean, well, it's not only that it generates money, it generates revenue, but it's also very quick and easy to do. Mm. Think about how many articles you read that's like, you know, three people tweeted something. Yes. That's, <laughs> that's, it's mildly offensive, but by the time you, feel, figure, you know, by time you get through the article, it's going to be super offensive. It's going to be like the worst thing in the world to you. 
Um, it's super easy to run that article. It probably gets hundreds of thousands of views if you're putting it up there. It doesn't, you don't have to spend money on, on investigating, fact checking, traveling, uh, you know, FOIA, records requests, none of that work. It's extremely easy. And I think that's part of why it's profitable because I do think that like well-produced, good journalism does get a lot of viewers and readers. I think people enjoy it and appreciate it, but it's also more expensive to do, right? Which is a challenge, I yep. think, for a lot of these people who are producing it and <clears throat> investing in it. And unfortunately, I think that's also created a situation where like, a lot of good media isn't necessarily profitable. We, we are kind of like at the behest of like philanthropists and billionaires who want to s spend money promoting something uh, like Pierre Omidyar did with The Intercept or like Peter Thiel is doing with, with some like alternative video platforms or things like that. I don't, I don't think it's all bad. Uh, there was an episode that uh, uh, of Joe Rogan's show he did, and I think it may have been with Matt Taibbi, I'm not sure, where they mentioned like anybody who goes for legit journalism right now is probably going to make a killing. You know, it's a, and, and we're already seeing with all these different sub stacks popping up. I mean, Glenn Greenwald, you have sub stack, uh, Michael Tracy, for instance, Matt Taibbi. And apparently they're doing really, uh, Barry Weiss. Mm. Yeah. They're all doing really, really well. I mean, TimCast.com is, uh, is doing really, really well. Mm. And so I will say there's always a challenge in trying to figure out if you're actually doing the right job or if you're just, you know, partisan. But I, I, I think it's fair to point out. Yeah, the establishment is just pushing narratives. Many of these outlets just want to uh, stick to their worldview. Side with the audience, they call it. And if their audience is, is, is trapped in a whirlpool of fake news garbage and hating someone else, siding with the audience isn't the right thing you want to do. No, you want to challenge. The, I, I, you don't even want to challenge. You want to be honest. So, so interestingly, you mentioned these articles where it's like they'll grab a few tweets and then post an article being like, you know, so-and-so said this. We've actually talked about this at TimCast.com because we've had a few articles where it's like so-and-so was criticized and then we show some tweets and I'm like, we won't do that. And I was like, hey, let's talk about this. this is this is it might be newsworthy to be fair. It might be because if like a congressperson makes an official statement about a specific policy that starts a feud or something and then it's just you're pulling tweets, that may be something people want to know about. But I said what we should do is if we see one of these Twitter spats, we're not just going to pull up someone on the right who's saying, you know, F you. I want to see what the left you know, prominent personalities are saying and the right. And then we want to actually break down the fact check of who is right and who is wrong. Now, that's a little bit more work. You had to actually do some journalism there, but that's the way it should be. Conversations are happening on Twitter. Very important ones. It's kind of silly in some ways. But if a congressperson is debating another congressperson, I think, you know, we want to talk about that. Look, I think part of it also is just like awareness. I think we were I did some work earlier this year for a guy named Justin Rosenstein. He was an early Google and Facebook guy. Uh, he also co-founded Asana. He made like, I don't know, he's like a, probably a billionaire worth of his Asana stock and Facebook. Um, and he, his conclusion was that he created all these technologies to help people cooperate with each other and work together as teams. Uh, but they all kind of went awry and everyone hates each other. There's a lot of division and everything. So basically he's giving away a ton of money through philanthropy and grant making because he feels guilty about all this. Um, I think that, you know, he started this company with, he started these companies with like good intentions. Like he was one of the founders of like the Facebook like button. And like, I think that they actively debated whether or not to make a dislike button, but they were like, we're not gonna do that because it'll be negative, it'll create negativity, people will get fighting and all that stuff. And, but it ended up, Facebook like ended up like being pretty bad anyway, because people are using it to share content. This is like dissing someone or attacking some out group or something. Um, but I think that, you know, there are large social and cultural changes that happen once you're aware that something is a problem. And I don't think that we looked at, you know, the uh, YouTubes and the social medias of the world and sort of the, the echo chambers, hyperpolarization, all this as a problem until very recently. I think even if you go back to like 2009, 2010, 2011, everyone was talking about how these things were great. We were all communicating with each other. Uh, they were helping Democrats in elections. So Democrats liked them versus yep. how they felt about Trump using it in 2006, 15, 16, um, or, or him using Twitter. Um, but I think now that we have the awareness of the problem, I kind of feel like the solutions will bubble up as after the awareness is built, because I think that's what's happened with other technologies that ended up being harmful for us. I think everything from we have much safer cars now with seatbelts and airbags um, to where we have a dramatic decline in smoking in the United States, right? Smoking was an addictive product. It was flying off the shelves, making people at Altria and so on and so forth, tons and tons of money. But I think once we recognize that it was a problem, start educating people about it, creating some alternatives, some minor regulations, I think we actually moved in a healthier direction. And I think something similar will happen with social media and a lot of what online, you know, monopolization has done to journalism. And part of that, I think, is antitrust, like getting very serious about the fact that these companies basically are the new standard oil. They are the new railroads. 
and that creating alternatives to them and creating healthier modes and models is very, very difficult while they have such high market share. And I, I think more Democrats and Republicans. Uh, in, in the Congress, you have Davis Cicilline, who's the head of the relevant committee in Congress on antitrust, and Ken Buck, who's the ranking de- Republican, actually agreeing on a lot of the core antitrust issues with a lot of these big companies. Um, it was funny that like, I think a third of the Republicans in the Senate voted for Lena Khan to join the, the FTC, who's a very progressive person who in many ways has talked about breaking up companies like Amazon or turning them into public utilities or having utility regulation uh, instead. So I think that we're seeing much more agreement that these things are a problem and some agreement on solutions. Now, do I, does that mean I think that a year or two from now we're gonna have an entirely different uh, online and social media environment, which I think ultimately would impact the media environment? No, but I do think over the long term, having that awareness and having that recognition is the first step towards creating something better. This is different though, right? With with these past things that were bad for us, asbestos and smoking and lead gas and stuff like that. I mean, that was neutral-ish. You, It was public interest versus the special interest that had money around a specific product or practice. Now you got half the country. So if we're talking about censorship, and you have this major shift where all of a sudden the, the you know, more establishment, like, I mean, like the neocons and the Democrats are basically in favor of massive multinational corporations curtailing speech. I don't see us fixing that because that directly impacts who gets elected in the first place. When Jack Dorsey can ban negative news about Hunter Biden, well, then Hunter Biden's dad gets elected. And, and depending on what you believe, I mean, there was a, there was a, a survey from Rasmussen which found that if people had been informed, because people didn't know about this, when they learned that Hunter Biden had done these things with Joe and these these shady business deals, they would not have voted for him. The margin was massive or or large enough to actually question, you know, it was like 10% of people said they wouldn't have voted for Biden had they known the truth. Well, we know that Facebook and Twitter suppressed negative news about a Democratic candidate. That being the case, why would any Democrat ever give in to any kind of legislative reform over these companies? The antitrust stuff I can see, yes. I don't think it'll solve the problem, though. What people need to understand about Facebook and Google is that antitrust makes sense simply because we're not, you know, some people say, oh, but, you know, who wants to use a bunch of different video platforms? We're not saying that. YouTube is a video platform. AdSense is an advertising platform. AdWords is, is, a, is an ad distribution platform. I mean, there, I think they change, the, now, now it's just Google Ads or whatever, but they, these are all different products. YouTube hosts your video and broadcasts it. Google, uh, Google sells ads on that. Google buys, uh, you know, buys and sells ads and, and, distrib- and distributes them. They also market your content to maximize viewership. These are different companies. In the past, you would find someone to record your music. You'd find someone to distribute your, mu- distribute your music. And then you would find people to promote your music on the radio. Today, YouTube. That's it. YouTube hosts and distributes. They're the ones who do all the ad selling, and they're the ones who determine who's going to be on the front page. You could break them up into three companies. Antitrust could come in and say, you know, everybody likes YouTube because that's where the videos are. Okay, YouTube, you no longer can do the ads. We're breaking this up into different companies. And then all of a sudden, you'd see way more competition and ad, ad rates. Probably ad rates would improve dramatically for a lot of people. You would then get spe- you, you would then get people at YouTube basically being like, you know, uh, this, this would be interesting because there would have to be individual deals with your channel and YouTube as to how revenue is generated. It'd be very, very complicated. It may actually even destroy YouTube because I don't know if YouTube is possible, if YouTube can even function without subsidy from Google in the first place. But that, it, if that's the case, there's a lot of questions we have to ask about major companies making tons of money doing one thing, subsidizing and cutting everyone else from the market by dumping money into another thing, right? So uh, a, a better example is, I won't name the big chain of coffee houses, of coffee shops, huh. just for legal reasons, but I've heard these stories from local mom and pop cafes where a big chain shop opens up next door and sells coffee at ridiculous prices, ridiculously low. Because they're well-funded by a massive conglomerate, they can sell at a loss. It chokes out the mom and pop shop because now all of a sudden you've got people like, why spend five bucks on my cap, you know, cappuccino when chain store has it for three bucks? Then once mom and pop goes out of business, chain store jacks the prices back up and now owns 100% of that market share. Though that, that, that's problematic. That's predatory behavior that we see a lot of. I know a lot of people on the right say that's simply just, oh, it's free market capitalism when they're allowed to do it. And I'm like, I mean, that's brutal. That's basically what YouTube does. 
Google just dumps money into these things. So Facebook, for instance, is the same thing, right? Facebook is a social network as well as an advertisement, uh, advertising sales and promotion, marketing, all of these things. I think we could look at that and find a way to break it apart. Thanks for checking out this clip from the TimCast IRL podcast. If you want to see the full show, come back to this channel, youtube.com slash TimCast IRL, Monday through Friday at 8 p.m., where you can leave comments and super chat, and we actually will read your comments on the show. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe. And if you want exclusive members-only content segments you can't get anywhere else, go to TimCast.com, become a member, and we even have full bonus episodes. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.